chapter four of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay east tennessee the loyalty of andrew johnson and his energetic defence of the union in the senate of the united states called public attention with peculiar force to eastern tennessee nominally the whole state was in rebellion really nearly one-third of its people occupying about one-third of its territory remained firm in their attachment to the government by repeated public conventions by a solemn appeal to the legislature and an overwhelming popular vote the region known as east tennessee protested against the usurpation and military domination which made them against their will aliens and enemies to the constitution and flag they revered at an election held on the eighth day of june eighteen sixty one at which the people were asked to ratify the military league with the southern confederacy and the provisional constitution of the confederate states twenty-nine counties of eastern tennessee cast only fourteen thousand seven hundred and eighty votes for separation and thirty two thousand nine hundred and twenty three votes against separation still further when the rebel governor ordered an election on the first thursday in august for delegates to the rebel congress that being the day fixed by the state constitution and laws for electing representatives to the congress of the united states the union electors in the second and fourth districts cast their ballots for horace maynard and andrew j clements in such numbers estimated at ten thousand votes in the second and at two thousand votes in the fourth that they were admitted to seats as representatives in the thirty-seventh congress the people of east tennessee finding no redress in petition or ballot gave signs of a determination to liberate themselves by force of arms upon unmistakable evidence of their loyalty the lincoln government made efforts to render them all possible assistance a considerable supply of arms and ammunition was sent to lieutenant william nelson in kentucky to be forwarded to the unionists in east tennessee and another navy lieutenant s p carter was commissioned specially to organize union regiments of tennesseans willing to enlist this however was a work of no little trouble and danger transportation was extremely difficult over the long mountain route without a railroad the rebel authorities were constantly watchful of this weak point in their offensive and defensive plans from the first governor harris treated east tennessee as a hostile and conquered country and his successive letters to jefferson davis form a continuous call for additional military force to hold that region in subjection the rebel general zala coffer's earliest duty had been to overawe the union sentiment of east tennessee and protect the important railroad line connecting distant parts of the confederacy the possession of which was indispensable to its military operations despite his vigilance union arms and ammunition were smuggled in and secret combinations begun between rigorous military repression on one side and chronic union uprising on the other a desperate condition of affairs grew up still further embittered by the gradual development of a malignant persecution of bolder unionists in the civil tribunals of the state an evil of which jefferson davis himself felt obliged to take notice all summer long president lincoln heard with sympathy from andrew johnson and others the reports of the patriotism and sufferings of their people it will be remembered that in the memorandum made by him after bull run he suggested a military movement from cincinnati on east tennessee since the culmination of affairs in kentucky with the prospect of early active operations such a project had acquired a new importance 
late in september he went to the war department and made the following memorandum which though not in the form of an express order was nevertheless intended as a substantial direction of military affairs on or about the fifth of october the exact date to be determined hereafter i wish a movement made to seize and hold a point on the railroad connecting virginia and tennessee near the mountain pass called cumberland gap that point is now guarded against us by zala Coffer, with six or eight thousand rebels at barbersville kentucky say twenty-five miles from the gap towards lexington we have a force of five or six thousand under general thomas at camp dick robinson about twenty-five miles from lexington and seventy-five from zala Coffer's camp on the road between the two there is not a railroad anywhere between lexington and the point to be seized and along the whole length of which the union sentiment among the people largely predominates we have military possession of the railroad from cincinnati to lexington and from louisville to lexington and some home guards under general crittenden are on the latter line we have possession of the railroad from louisville to nashville tennessee so far as muldraft's hill about forty miles and the rebels have possession of that road all south of there at the hill we have a force of eight thousand under general sherman and about an equal force of rebels is a very short distance south under general buckner we have a large force at paducah and a smaller at fort holt both on the kentucky side with some at bird's point cairo mound city evansville and new albany all on the other side and all which with the gunboats on the river are perhaps sufficient to guard the ohio from louisville to its mouth about supplies of troops my general idea is that all from wisconsin minnesota iowa illinois missouri and kansas not now elsewhere be left to fremont all from indiana and michigan not now elsewhere be sent to anderson at louisville all from ohio needed in western virginia be sent there and any remainder be sent to mitchell at cincinnati for anderson all east of the mountains be appropriated to mcclellan and to the coast as to movements my idea is that the one for the coast and that on cumberland gap be simultaneous and that in the meantime preparation vigilant watching and the defensive only be acted upon this however not to apply to fremont's operations in northern and middle missouri that before these movements thomas and sherman shall respectively watch but not attack zollicoffer and buckner that when the coast and gap movements shall be ready sherman is merely to stand fast while all at cincinnati and all at louisville with all on the line concentrate rapidly at lexington and thence to thomas's camp joining him and the whole thence upon the gap it is for the military men to decide whether they can find a pass through the mountains at or near the gap which cannot be defended by the enemy with a greatly inferior force and what is to be done in regard to this the coast and gap movements made generals mcclellan and fremont in their respective departments will avail themselves of any advantages the diversions may present notwithstanding president lincoln's earnest interest in this project and the almost express order above quoted one obstacle after another arose to prevent its being carried out the special attention of general thomas was also upon it a brigade of east tennesseans was being enlisted at camp dick robinson who came there because they could not with safety be organized in their own homes under the eyes of zollicoffer from them and more especially from lieutenant carter thomas obtained such current information as made him anxious to lead an expedition through cumberland gap he several times recommended the movement asking general anderson october four for four good regiments with transportation and ammunition and adding 
i believe if i could get such a force here and be ready to march in ten days from this time that i could seize on the railroad at knoxville and cut off all communication between memphis and virginia the washington authorities meanwhile probably uninformed of general thomas's spirit and confidence designated general o m mitchell for the duty this apparent slight touched general thomas's pride and he asked to be relieved sherman however interfered informing him that mitchell was subject to his command and intimating that he thomas would not be robbed of his opportunity while the secretary of war was visiting sherman as already mentioned he also urged upon the general his personal desire that the cumberland ford and gap should be seized and the east tennessee and virginia railroad taken possession of and the artery that supplied the rebellion cut we have seen that sherman was in no mood for the enterprise that on the contrary he wanted large reinforcements for defence and though thomas once more november five earnestly suggested that with four more good regiments we could seize the railroad yet and again with my headquarters at somerset i can easily seize the most favourable time for invading east tennessee which ought to be done this winter sherman expressed his belief that they would have enough to do in kentucky and directed thomas simply to hold zollicoffer in check and await events indeed from this time forward sherman grew more and more apprehensive till at length he could scarcely endure his great responsibility our forces too small to do good and too large to sacrifice he reported on november three the future looks dark as possible he again wrote to washington november sixth it would be better if some more sanguine mind were here for i am forced to order according to my convictions sherman has himself recorded that a certain degree of public clamor had arisen about his military administration in kentucky and particularly that he was charged in unfriendly newspapers with being insane when therefore he was soon after relieved from command he attributed it to this cause this belief was altogether incorrect the fact that he had asked to be relieved and had no faith in his own ability to perform the service required with the means furnished sufficiently accounts for the change but there exists in addition positive evidence that the president was in no wise influenced by the newspaper slander upon a letter from mr guthrie indicating that the union men of kentucky were unwilling to lose general sherman's presence and services but that a question of rank stood in the way mr lincoln made the endorsement if general mcclellan thinks it proper to make buell a major-general enabling sherman to return to kentucky it would rather please me the retirement of general scott on the first of november and the elevation of mcclellan to the command of general-in-chief brought with it as usual many changes in minor commands brigadier-general d c buell previously chosen by general anderson for service in kentucky was mcclellan's intimate friend and the new general-in-chief probably needed no special inducement to give so important a duty to a favorite who was in addition an accomplished soldier his qualities as a commander were yet to be developed like mcclellan himself up to the outbreak of the war he had obtained but little rank the department of the ohio was formed on november nine and general buell assigned to its command one good quality confidence he manifested at the outset sherman he wrote still insists that i require two hundred thousand men i am quite content to try with a good many less in an interview with mcclellan before buell went to kentucky the two friends had fully discussed their respective duties and hopes mcclellan immediately began sending him reinforcements and in his first written instruction made the east tennessee movement a prime object this injunction he repeated and emphasized from time to time i am still convinced that political and strategical considerations render a prompt movement in force on eastern tennessee imperative 
the object to be gained is to cut the communication between the mississippi valley and eastern virginia to protect our union friends in tennessee and re-establish the government of the union in the eastern portion of that state i think we owe it to our union friends in eastern tennessee to protect them at all hazards first secure that then if you possess the means carry nashville if you gain and retain possession of eastern tennessee you will have won brighter laurels than any i hope to gain i tell the east tennessee men here to rest quiet that you will take care of them and will never desert them as soon as congress met president lincoln made another effort to forward the expedition which he had so much at heart his study of the subject with military men showed him that the problem of transportation was the main difficulty the east tennessee campaign would have to encounter to obviate this he proposed to congress the construction of a military railroad to cumberland gap or knoxville i deem it of importance said his annual message that the loyal regions of east tennessee and western north carolina should be connected with kentucky and other faithful parts of the union by railroad i therefore recommend as a military measure that congress provide for the construction of such road as speedily as possible kentucky no doubt will cooperate and through her legislature make the most judicious selection of a line the northern terminus must connect with some existing railroad and whether the route shall be from lexington or nicholasville to the cumberland gap or from lebanon to the tennessee line in the direction of knoxville or on some still different line can easily be determined kentucky and the general government cooperating the work can be completed in a very short time and when done it will be not only of vast present usefulness but also a valuable permanent improvement worth its cost in all the future in addition he went personally before a senate committee to explain and urge the project the subject was referred to a select committee and a bill was reported and passed to a second reading but as the committee and the senate were still in that flush of early sanguine enthusiasm which expected the rebellion to be crushed by a single vigorous campaign and especially as the army made no advance against cumberland gap but moved almost its entire strength in a different direction the subject was neglected and dropped amid the hurry of more pressing legislation it would seem that the general direction of central authority could scarcely be made stronger without descending to such details as must in war always be left to the determination of local conditions and to that judgment which an officer founds upon his personal observation apparently general buell accepted the instruction which had been given him but mcclellan quickly discovered that the reinforcements sent were not being placed with reference to east tennessee what is the reason he inquired by telegraph for concentration of troops at louisville i urge movement at once on eastern tennessee unless it is impossible here buell ought to have sent a straightforward reply either that it was impossible or that he would obey instead of this he answered evasively suggesting several alternative plans but giving no indications of a willingness to act his chief solicitude was reinforcement drill organization these were certainly useful perhaps necessary but when they interfered with the prosecution of an enterprise specifically directed by his superior he should not have left his intentions unexplained ten days more ran on and andrew johnson and horace maynard who were in washington attending congress sent buell an anxious dispatch our people are oppressed and pursued as beasts of the forest the government must come to their relief his reply kept the word of promise to the ear i assure you i recognize no more imperative duty and crave no higher honor than that of rescuing our loyal friends in tennessee whose sufferings and heroism i think i can appreciate but his letter to mcclellan of the same day if they could have seen it would have sadly chilled their hope 
i do not mean to be diverted more than is absolutely necessary from what i regard as of the first importance the organization of my forces now little better than a mob in his letter of two days later by way of making amends he said he had organized a division at lebanon with special reference to east tennessee but hinted that he would convince mcclellan it could be used to better advantage elsewhere to leave him no excuse the war department telegraphed him december twenty do you need more regiments than are now under your orders if so how many his reply indicated that he realized he was trying the patience of the government i am not willing to say that i need more regiments i can use more with decided advantage if they can be sent his more formal answer acknowledged that he had an aggregate of some seventy thousand men about fifty seven thousand for duty and his letter at length discloses the idea upon which he had been acting the plan which i proposed for the troops here is one of defence on the east and of invasion on the south finally the approach of the new year together with other circumstances again brought the question so long evaded and neglected sharply to his attention johnson maynard etc are again becoming frantic mcclellan telegraphed him on december twenty ninth and have president lincoln's sympathy excited political considerations would make it advisable to get the arms and troops into eastern tennessee at a very early day you are however the best judge can you tell me about when and in what force you will be in eastern tennessee whether he intended it or not he once more sent an evasive and misleading response it startles me to think he wrote on december twenty nine how much time has elapsed since my arrival and to find myself still in louisville i have this moment received your dispatch i intend a column of twelve thousand men with three batteries for east tennessee but as i have telegraphed you it is impossible to fix a time for it to be there so much depends on the circumstances which may arise in the meantime in any event i must tell you what i have been unwilling to do all along that you will require more troops in kentucky don't acknowledge this however but act on it this last qualified promise did not long serve to postpone the decisive avowal that buell had been hitherto allowing the administration to entertain delusive hopes prompted by causes which are related elsewhere president lincoln on the fourth of january telegraphed him the definite question have arms gone forward for east tennessee please tell me the progress and condition of the movement in that direction answer in his reply buell for the first time after nearly two months of evasion fully let out the secret that his plans lay in another quarter while my preparations have had this movement constantly in view i will confess to your excellency that i have been bound to it more by my sympathy for the people of east tennessee and the anxiety with which you and the general-in-chief have desired it than by my opinion of its wisdom as an unconditional measure as earnestly as i wish to accomplish it my judgment has from the first been decidedly against it if it should render at all doubtful the success of a movement against the great power of the rebellion in the west which is mainly arrayed on the line from columbus to bowling green and can speedily be concentrated at any point of that line which is attacked singly president lincoln's comment on this extraordinary avowal is in that generous and forbearing tone which forms one of his characteristic traits but it does not conceal his sadness that the cause is to lose an advantage which a resolute commander might have grasped your dispatch of yesterday has been received and it disappoints and distresses me i have shown it to general mcclellan who says he will write you to-day i am not competent to criticize your views and therefore what i offer is in justification of myself of the two i would rather have a point on the railroad south of cumberland gap than nashville first because it cuts a great artery of the enemy's communication which nashville does not and secondly because it is in the midst of loyal people who would rally around it while nashville is not 
again i cannot see why the movement on east tennessee would not be a diversion in your favor rather than a disadvantage assuming that a movement towards nashville is the main object but my distress is that our friends in east tennessee are being hanged and driven to despair and even now i fear are thinking of taking rebel arms for the sake of personal protection in this we lose the most valuable stake we have in the south my dispatch to which yours is an answer was sent with the knowledge of senator johnson and representative maynard of east tennessee and they will be upon me to know the answer which i cannot safely show them they would despair possibly resign to go and save their families somehow or die with them i do not intend this to be an order in any sense but merely as intimated before to show you the grounds of my anxiety mcclellan did not let buell off so easily a sensitive officer would have little relish to be told that he had not only caused himself to be misunderstood but had deranged the plans of his superior i was extremely sorry wrote mcclellan the same day to learn from your telegram to the president that you had from the beginning attached little or no importance to a movement in east tennessee i had not so understood your views and it develops a radical difference between your views and my own which i deeply regret my own general plans for the prosecution of the war make the speedy occupation of east tennessee and its lines of railway matters of absolute necessity bowling green and nashville are in that connection of very secondary importance at the present moment my own advance cannot according to my present views be made until your troops are solidly established in the eastern portion of tennessee if that is not possible a complete and prejudicial change in my own plans at once becomes necessary interesting as nashville may be to the louisville interests it strikes me that its possession is of very secondary importance in comparison with the immense results that would arise from the adherence to our cause of the masses in east tennessee west north carolina south carolina north georgia and alabama results that i feel assured would ere long flow from the movement i allude to this candid lecture was within a week supplemented by another letter from the general-in-chief to buell containing a suggestion so strong as almost to amount to a positive order you have no idea of the pressure brought to bear here upon the government for a forward movement it is so strong that it seems absolutely necessary to make the advance on eastern tennessee at once i incline to this as a first step for many reasons your possession of the railroad there will surely prevent the main army in my front from being reinforced and may force johnston to detach its political effect will be very great in his answer written the same day buell at length promised to carry out the instruction as i told you in my dispatch i shall now devote myself to it contenting myself as far as bowling green is concerned with holding it in check and concealing my design as long as possible but though he in the same letter acknowledged that the numerical strength of his command had risen to ninety thousand men he could not bring himself to act even in fulfilment of his own definite promise nearly three weeks later he wrote a letter alleging that the want of transportation and the condition of the roads had thwarted the programme to a long argument in support of this opinion he added for the reasons i have stated i have been forced reluctantly to the conviction that an advance into east tennessee is impracticable at this time on any scale which will be sufficient the real reason of his conviction appears in a few sentences which follow and which show a final decision to carry out his long-cherished design of a movement in force against bowling green if there be a question among military experts as to the momentary feasibility or local value of this east tennessee movement there can be none when considered in its influence and relation to the whole great theatre of war 
a glance at the map and a study of attendant circumstances can leave no doubt that it was entirely possible to have seized and held the mountain region of eastern tennessee and that such an occupation would have been a severance of the rebel confederacy almost as complete and damaging to its military strength as the opening of the mississippi if also there had been any doubt about the earnestness of the union sentiment of the people of eastern tennessee events soon developed ample proofs of their patriotism and devotion to the government the reader will remember the transmittal of arms and ammunition by nelson and carter and the formation of secret military organizations by the bolder unionists rumors and promises of the coming of a union army also reached them from time to time in such form as to excite their hope and measurably inspire their reliance had general thomas been permitted to march his column to cumberland gap and knoxville as he desired about the first of november his presence would have been favored by extraordinary events startling news reached the rebel secretary of war on the ninth of november two large bridges telegraphed a railroad president on my road were burned last night about twelve o'clock also one bridge on the east tennessee and georgia railroad at the same time and an effort made to burn the largest bridge on my road there is great excitement along the whole line of road and evidence that the union party are organizing and preparing to destroy or take possession of the whole line from bristol to chattanooga two days later the commanding officer at knoxville wrote further details my fears expressed to you by letters and dispatches of the fourth and fifth instance have been realized by the destruction of no less than five railroad bridges two on the east tennessee and virginia road one on the east tennessee and georgia road and two on the western and atlantic road the indications were apparent to me but i was powerless to avert it the whole country is now in a state of rebellion a thousand men are within six miles of strawberry plains bridge and an attack is contemplated to-morrow an attack was made on watauga yesterday our men succeeded in beating them off but they are gathering in larger force and may renew it in a day or two they are not yet fully organized and have no subsistence to enable them to hold out long i learned from two gentlemen just arrived that another camp is being formed about ten miles from here in sevier county and already three hundred are in camp they are being reinforced from blunt roan johnson green carter and other counties i need not say that great alarm is felt by the few southern men civil war has broken out at length in east tennessee said another letter in the late election scarcely a so-called union man voted they look confidently for the re-establishment of the federal authority in the south with as much confidence as the jews look for the coming of the messiah and i feel quite sure when i assert it that no event or circumstance can change or modify their hopes in this state of affairs this part and indeed all of east tennessee will be subjected during the war to apprehensions of internal revolt more or less remote as the tide of war turns in this direction the recent bridge burning in this section was occasioned by the hope that the federal troops would be here in a few days from kentucky to second their efforts there are now camped in and about elizabethtown in carter county some one thousand two hundred or one thousand five hundred men armed with a motley assortment of guns in open defiance of the confederate states of america and who are awaiting a movement of the federal troops from kentucky to march forward and take possession of the railroad these men are gathered up from three or five counties in this region and comprise the hostile union element of this section and never will be appeased conciliated or quieted in a southern confederacy to these appeals from persons of local prominence governor harris of tennessee added his earnest entreaty the burning of railroad bridges in east tennessee shows a deep-seated spirit of rebellion in that section union men are organizing this rebellion must be crushed out instantly the leaders arrested and summarily punished the richmond authorities were not slow to respond two regiments from memphis and another from pensacola were ordered to east tennessee in all haste with such miscellaneous companies and fragments as could be gathered up nearer the scene of disturbance 
troops are now moving to east tennessee to crush the traitors telegraphed the rebel secretary of war you shall be amply protected there is little need to relate the quick and unsparing movements by the confederate troops against the union combinations the uprising seems to have been ill-advised and ill-concerted unsupported as it was by federal forces the hasty gatherings of the loyalists were quickly dispersed and many of the participants captured the course of the richmond government towards the east tennessee traders however deserves to be remembered in the eyes of jefferson davis treason to the union was a holy duty while treason to their usurpation was deserving of exemplary punishment which in this instance was ordered with apparent relish i am very glad telegraphed the confederate secretary of war to hear of the action of the military authorities and hope to hear they have hung every bridge burner at the end of the burned bridge to the officer in charge of the prisoners he gave specific instructions first all such as can be identified as having been engaged in bridge burning are to be tried summarily by drumhead court-martial and if found guilty executed on the spot by hanging it would be well to leave their bodies hanging in the vicinity of the burned bridges second all such as have not been so engaged are to be treated as prisoners of war and sent with an armed guard to tuscaloosa alabama there to be kept imprisoned at the depot selected by the government for prisoners of war p s judge patterson colonel pickens and other ringleaders of the same class must be sent at once to tuscaloosa to jail as prisoners of war under these stimulating orders which were distinctly approved by jefferson davis the military commanders executed their task with a zeal which seems to have outrun all discretion a veritable reign of terror ensued several bridge burners were hung with impressive publicity the jails were filled with accused persons and carloads of the more notable suspects were shipped to the military prison at tuscaloosa when the civil laws and judicial process were invoked to ward off in some measure this wholesale proscription the commanding officer placed the city of knoxville under martial law until such time as all the prisoners charged with military offences now in my custody can be tried by a military tribunal persecution so ran riot that one of the subordinate confederate officers at last felt obliged to protest against it i have just been appointed commandant of this post knoxville and have already discovered numberless abuses that should be corrected marauding bands of armed men go through the country representing themselves to be the authorized agents of the state or confederate government they impress into service horses and men they plunder the helpless and especially the quondam supporters of johnson maynard and brownlow they force men to enlist by the representation that otherwise they will be incarcerated at tuscaloosa they force the people to feed and care for themselves and horses without compensation i would gladly have instructions as to the mode of correcting these abuses and the character of punishment to be inflicted upon those guilty of such offences a feeble response of moderation came from richmond in relation to the abuses mentioned the secretary expects you to be vigilant and energetic in suppressing them but the officer was further directed to look for particular instructions to another of his superiors whose severity was also notorious in the case of the most conspicuous of the union ringleaders the confederate government narrowly escaped the odium of what would have been a signal injustice and breach of faith which its overzealous partisans were eager to perpetuate local rebel vindictiveness centred itself against the editor of the knoxville whig the well-known parson william g brownlow who had opposed and denounced secession and rebellion in his journal and elsewhere in bitter and unstinted language when the uprising took place he was naturally suspected of having been its chief instigator and though he disavowed all knowledge of the bridge burning and publicly opposed and condemned local insurrection his enemies adhered to their belief in his guilt and on numerous occasions threatened him with personal violence he appealed for protection to one of the confederate commanders and promised to leave the country if he could have safeguard in his exit upon assurance that this would be done he surrendered himself to the military authorities but was immediately arrested for treason on a civil writ it must be recorded to the credit of secretary benjamin that he resisted the importunate clamours for brownlow's trial and punishment and kept the honour of the confederate government by finally ordering him to be conveyed under military protection within the union lines
End of chapter four. Chapter five of Abraham Lincoln, a history, volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, a history, volume five by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter five Halleck in sending general hunter to relieve fremont the president did not intend that he should remain in charge of the department of the west out of its vast extent the department of kansas was created a few days afterward embracing the state of kansas the indian territory west of arkansas and the territories of nebraska colorado and dakota with headquarters at fort leavenworth and hunter was transferred to its command general halleck was assigned to the department of the missouri embracing the states of missouri iowa minnesota wisconsin illinois arkansas and that portion of kentucky west of the cumberland river to become the more permanent successor of fremont by this division the government had a special object in view namely to organize a column which should march southward along the western frontier and by such a march bring about several results each of them important in itself and of cumulative influence upon the general plan of western operations then in contemplation it would protect the state of kansas it would serve to hold or repossess the indian territory it would by a comparatively short route reach and enter the northeastern corner of the state of texas where it might perhaps encourage the overawed and suppressed union sentiment or in the alternative effect a junction with an expedition to be sent by sea and thus hold the lone star state to her federal allegiance but all this would be contingent upon unchecked success it was known that such an enterprise would encounter serious obstacles the confederate government had among its earliest movements reached out boldly to secure the indian territory under shelter of the arkansas insurrection general albert pike with flatteries and promises secured a nominal adhesion of the principal indian chiefs to the confederacy it was perhaps not unknown to him that with the usual fickleness of savage policy some of them were making equally ardent and equally untrustworthy protestations on the other side on the whole the rebellion had the better prospect of retaining their support since for the moment it was in practical possession of the indian territory with four regiments of indians organized as the nucleus of a confederate army this however was the highest stage of its success no strong confederate forces made their appearance no confederate battles were won the promised annuities did not arrive from the confederate treasury and the faith and cooperation of the indians began to wane as elsewhere in the south loyalty to the union was not wholly extinguished a loyal creek chief hopo ithaleo hola raised the banner of revolt against secession gathered something over two thousand adherents and fought several battles during the months of november and december eighteen sixty one it required all the available indian forces in confederate pay to suppress and hold in check this armed demonstration in favor of the flag which for half a century had brought to the red men the voice of friendship and stated installments of money and goods to redeem the promise of old and solemn treaties in addition to the danger in its intended pathway the proposed expedition encountered fatal obstacles in its very organization 
among the earliest calls for troops president lincoln had given senator james h lane authority to raise a brigade in kansas the regiments composing it contained much of that free and reckless fighting material of the frontier which had been educated by the missouri border ruffians to guerrilla methods the necessity of defending the kansas border against secession bushwhackers from missouri kept these regiments at home and continued their predatory habits and in their rapid forays they often failed to discriminate between friend and foe halleck the new commander of the department of the west several times had occasion to complain of their mischief he protested against lane's appointment as brigadier-general he not only disapproved the lawlessness committed by lane's men but issued orders to drive them from his department or if caught to disarm them and hold them prisoners they are no better he wrote than a band of robbers they cross the line rob steal plunder and burn whatever they can lay their hands upon they disgrace the name and uniform of american soldiers and are driving good union men into the ranks of the secession army president lincoln saw that a substratum of personal prejudice lay under this somewhat harsh condemnation which extended not merely to lane's soldiers but to the entire separate texas expedition as well halleck complained of movements having been governed by political expediency and in many cases directed by politicians in order to subserve particular interests lane was indeed chargeable with a selfish ambition in this proposed movement and soon endeavored even to supplant hunter lincoln recognizing lane's great energy and influence in kansas had intended to make it tributary to the union cause but he had no idea of giving him the superior direction or management his letters show with what prudence but also with what firmness he interfered to regulate this distant personal entanglement it is my wish he wrote january thirty one eighteen sixty two that the expedition commonly called the lane expedition shall be as much as has been promised at the adjutant general's office under the supervision of general mcclellan and not any more i have not intended and do not now intend that it shall be a great exhausting affair but a snug sober column of ten thousand or fifteen thousand general lane has been told by me many times that he is under the command of general hunter and assented to it as often as told it was the distinct agreement between him and me when i appointed him that he was to be under hunter all lane's efforts to set aside hunter proved fruitless under date of february tenth eighteen sixty two lincoln repeated his decision my wish has been and is to avail the government of the services of both general hunter and general lane and so far as possible to personally oblige both general hunter is the senior officer and must command when they serve together though in so far as he can consistently with the public service and his own honor oblige general lane he will also oblige me if they cannot come to an amicable understanding general lane must report to general hunter for duty according to the rules or decline the service naturally after this lane lost his interest in the expedition of which he had caused himself to be proclaimed the real leader and hero halleck's decided aversion to the whole scheme already rendered it practically useless and other causes soon assisted to divert the forces gathered for the purpose to different destinations it came officially to an end when on march eleventh eighteen sixty two hunter's department was once more consolidated with halleck's henry wager halleck was born in westernville oneida county new york january fifteenth eighteen fifteen he was educated at union college and entered the military academy at west point where he was graduated third in a class of thirty-one 
and was made second lieutenant of engineers july one eighteen thirty nine while yet a cadet he was employed at the academy as assistant professor of engineering from the first he devoted himself with constant industry to the more serious studies of his profession he had attained a first lieutenancy when the mexican war broke out and was sent to the pacific coast a variety of valuable services in the military and naval operations prosecuted there secured him the brevet of captain from may one eighteen forty seven on the conquest of california by the united states forces he took part in the political organization of the new state first as secretary of state under the military governors and afterwards as leading member of the convention which framed the constitution under which california was admitted to the union he remained in the army and in charge of various engineering duties on the pacific coast until august one eighteen fifty four having been meanwhile promoted captain of engineers at that date he resigned his commission to engage in civil pursuits he became a member of a law firm and was also interested in mines and railroads when the outbreak of the rebellion called him again into the military service of the government he had become not only practically accomplished in his profession as a soldier but also distinguished as a writer on military art and science halleck's high qualifications were well understood and appreciated by general scott at whose suggestion he was appointed major-general in the regular army to date from august nineteenth eighteen sixty one with orders to report himself at army headquarters in washington a phrase in one of scott's letters setting forth mcclellan's disregard for his authority creates an inference that the old general intended that halleck should succeed him in chief command but when the latter reached washington the confusion and disasters in the department of the west were at their culmination and urgent necessity required him to be sent thither to succeed fremont general halleck arrived at st louis on november eighteen eighteen sixty one and assumed command on the nineteenth his written instructions stated forcibly the reforms he was expected to bring about and his earliest reports indicate that his difficulties had not been overstated irregularities in contracts great confusion in organization everywhere a want of arms and supplies absence of routine and discipline added to this was reported danger from the enemy i am satisfied he telegraphed under date of november twenty nine that the enemy is operating in and against this state with a much larger force than was supposed when i left washington and also that a general insurrection is organizing in the counties near the missouri river between boonville and st joseph a desperate effort will be made to supply and winter their troops in this state so as to spare their own resources for a summer campaign an invasion was indeed in contemplation but rumor had magnified its available strength general price had since the battle of lexington lingered in southwestern missouri and was once more preparing for a northward march his method of campaigning was peculiar and needed only the minimum of organization and preparation his troops were made up mainly of young reckless hardy missourians to whom a campaign was an adventure of pastime and excitement and who brought each man his own horse gun and indispensable equipments and clothing the usual burdens of an army commissariat and transportation were of little moment to these partisans who started up as if by magic from every farm and thicket and gathered their supplies wherever they went to quote the language of one of the missouri rebel leaders our forces to combat or cut them off would require only a haversack to where the enemy would require a wagon 
the evil of the system was that such forces vanished quite as rapidly as they assembled the enthusiastic squads with which price had won his victory at lexington were scattered among their homes and haunts the first step of a campaign therefore involved the gathering of a new army and this proved not so easy in the opening storms of winter as it had in the fine midsummer weather on the twenty sixth of november eighteen sixty one price issued a call for fifty thousand men the language of his proclamation however breathed more of despair than confidence he reminded his adherents that only one in forty had answered to the former call and that boys and small property holders have in the main fought the battles for the protection of your property he repeated many times with emphasis i must have fifty thousand men his prospects were far from encouraging mcculloch in a mood of stubborn disagreement was withdrawing his army to arkansas where he went into winter quarters later on when price formally requested his co-operation mcculloch as formally refused for the moment the confederate cause in southwestern missouri was languishing ex-governor jackson made a show of keeping it alive by calling the fugitive remnant of his rebel legislature together at neosho and with the help of his sole official relic the purloined state seal enacting the well-worn farce of passing a secession ordinance and making a military league with the confederate states the confederate congress at richmond responded to the farce with an act to admit missouri to the confederacy an act of more promise at least appropriating a million dollars to aid the confederate cause in that state had been passed in the preceding august such small instalment of this fund however as was transmitted failed even to pay the soldiers who for their long service had not as yet received a dime in return the richmond authorities asked the transfer of missouri troops to the confederate service but with this request the rebel missouri leaders were unable immediately to comply when under date of december thirty eighteen sixty one ex-governor jackson complained of neglect and once more urged that price be made commander in missouri jefferson davis responded sarcastically that not a regiment had been tendered and that he could not appoint a general before he had troops for him from all these causes price's projected winter campaign failed and he attributed the failure to mcculloch's refusal to help him the second branch of the rebel program in missouri that of raising an insurrection north of the missouri river proved more effective halleck was scarcely in command when the stir and agitation of depredations and burning of bridges by small squads of secessionists in disguise was reported from various counties of northern missouri federal detachments went in pursuit and the perpetrators as usual disappeared only however to break out with fresh outrages when quiet and safety had apparently been restored it was soon evident that this was not merely a manifestation of neighborhood disloyalty but that it was part of a deliberate system instigated by the principal rebel leaders do you intend to regard men wrote price to halleck january twelfth eighteen sixty two whom i have specially dispatched to destroy roads burn bridges tear up culverts etc as amenable to an enemy's court-martial or will you have them to be tried as usual by the proper authorities according to the statutes of the state halleck who had placed the state under martial law to enable him to deal more effectually with this class of offenders stated his authority and his determination with distinct emphasis in his reply of january twenty two eighteen sixty two you must be aware general that no orders of yours can save from punishment spies marauders robbers incendiaries guerrilla bands etc who violate the laws of war you cannot give immunity to crime 
but let us fully understand each other on this point if you send armed forces wearing the garb of soldiers and duly organized and enrolled as legitimate belligerents to destroy railroads bridges etc as a military act we shall kill them if possible in open warfare or if we capture them we shall treat them as prisoners of war but it is well understood that you have sent numbers of your adherents in the garb of peaceful citizens and under false pretenses through our lines into northern missouri to rob and destroy the property of union men and to burn and destroy railroad bridges thus endangering the lives of thousands and this too without any military necessity or possible military advantage moreover peaceful citizens of missouri quietly working on their farms have been instigated by your emissaries to take up arms as insurgents and to rob and plunder and to commit arson and murder they do not even act under the garb of soldiers but under false pretenses and in the guise of peaceful citizens you certainly will not pretend that men guilty of such crimes although specially appointed and instructed by you are entitled to the rights and immunities of ordinary prisoners of war one important effect which price had hoped to produce by the guerrilla rising he was instigating was to fill his army with recruits the most populous and truest counties of the state he wrote lie upon or north of the missouri river i sent a detachment of one thousand one hundred men to lexington which after remaining only a part of one day gathered together about two thousand five hundred recruits and escorted them in safety to me at osceola his statement was partly correct but other causes contributed both to this partial success and the partial defeat which immediately followed just at the time this expedition went to lexington the various federal detachments north of the missouri river were engaged in driving a number of secession guerrilla bands southward across that stream halleck was directing the combined movements of the union troops and had stationed detachments of pope's forces south of the missouri river with the design of intercepting and capturing the fugitive bands the failure of some of the reports to reach him disconcerted and partly frustrated his design the earlier guerrilla parties which crossed at and near lexington escaped and made their way to price but the later ones were intercepted and captured as halleck had planned colonel davis came upon the enemy near milford late this afternoon reported pope december nineteenth and having driven in his pickets assaulted him in force a brisk skirmish ensued when the enemy finding himself surrounded and cut off surrendered at discretion one thousand three hundred prisoners including three colonels and seventeen captains one thousand stands of arms one thousand horses sixty-five wagons tents baggage and supplies have fallen into our hands our loss is two killed and eight wounded on the next day he found his capture was still larger and he telegraphed from sedalia just arrived here troops much embarrassed with nearly two thousand prisoners and great quantity of captured property in anticipation of the capture or dispersion of these northwestern detachments of rebels halleck had directed the collection of an army at and about rolla with a view to move in force against price on december twenty five brigadier general samuel r curtis was assigned to the command of the union troops to operate in the southwestern district of missouri some ten thousand men were gathered to form his column and the possibility of a short and successful campaign was before him had he known price's actual condition but the situation was one of difficulty the railroad ended at rolla springfield the supposed location of price's camp was a hundred and twenty miles further to the southwest by bad roads through a mountainous country rebel sympathy was strong throughout the whole region and the favoring surroundings enabled price to conceal his designs and magnify his numbers rumors came that he intended to fight at springfield and the estimates of his strength varied from twenty thousand to forty thousand 
the greatest obstacle to pursuit was the severity of the winter weather nevertheless the union soldiers bore their privations with admirable patience and fortitude and halleck urged a continuance of the movement through every hindrance and discouragement i have ordered general curtis to move forward he wrote to mcclellan january fourteenth with all his infantry and artillery his force will not be less than twelve thousand the enemy is reported to have between thirty-five and forty guns general curtis has only twenty-four but i send him six pieces to-morrow and will send six more in a few days i also propose placing a strong reserve at rolla which can be sent forward if necessary the weather is intensely cold and the troops supplied as they are with very inferior clothing blankets and tents must suffer greatly in a winter campaign and yet i see no way of avoiding it unless price is driven from the state insurrections will continually occur in all the central and northern counties so as to prevent the withdrawal of our troops a few days later january eighteen eighteen sixty two halleck wrote to curtis that he was about to reinforce him with an entire division from pope's army increasing his strength to fifteen thousand that he would send him mittens for his soldiers get as many hand-mills as you can for grinding corn take the bull by the horns i will back you in such force requisitions when they become necessary for supplying the forces we must have no failure in this movement against price it must be the last and once more on january twenty seventh he repeated his urgent admonition there is a strong pressure on us for troops and all that are not absolutely necessary here must go elsewhere pope's command is entirely broken up four thousand in davis's reserve and six thousand ordered to cairo push on as rapidly as possible and end the matter with price this trying winter campaign led by general curtis though successful in the end did not terminate so quickly as general halleck had hoped leaving the heroic western soldiers camping and scouting in the snows and cutting winds of the missouri hills and prairies we must call attention to other events of the western department while halleck was gratifying the government and the northern public by the ability and vigor of his measures one point of his administration had excited vehement criticism his military instinct and method were so thorough that they caused him to treat too lightly the political aspects of the great conflict of which he was directing so large a share fremont's treatment of the slavery question had been too radical halleck's now became too conservative it is not probable that this grew out of his mere wish to avoid the error of his predecessor but out of his own personal conviction that the issue must be entirely eliminated from the military problem he had noted the difficulties and discussions growing out of the dealings of the army with fugitive slaves and hoping to rid himself of a continual dilemma one of his first acts after assuming command was to issue his famous general order number no. three november twenty eighteen sixty one the first paragraph of which ran as follows it has been represented that important information respecting the numbers and condition of our forces is conveyed to the enemy by means of fugitive slaves who are admitted within our lines in order to remedy this evil it is directed that no such persons be hereafter permitted to enter the lines of any camp or of any forces on the march and that any now within such lines be immediately excluded therefrom this language brought upon him the indignant protest of the combined anti-slavery sentiment of the north he was berated in newspapers and denounced in congress and the violence of public condemnation threatened seriously to impair his military usefulness he had indeed gone too far the country felt and the army knew that so far from being generally true that negroes carried valuable information to the enemy the very reverse was the rule and that the contrabands in reality constituted one of the most important and trustworthy sources of knowledge to union commanders a medium of communication which later in the war came to be jocosely designated the grapevine telegraph 
halleck soon found himself put on the defensive and wrote an explanatory letter which was printed in the newspapers a little later he took occasion to define officially his intention the object of these orders is to prevent any person in the army from acting in the capacity of negro catcher or negro stealer the relation between the slave and his master or pretended master is not a matter to be determined by military officers except in the single case provided for by congress this matter in all other cases must be decided by the civil authorities one object in keeping fugitive slaves out of our camp is to keep clear of all such questions orders number three do not apply to the authorized private servants of officers nor the negroes employed by proper authority in the camps it applies only to fugitive slaves the prohibition to admit them within our lines does not prevent the exercise of all proper offices of humanity in giving them food and clothing outside where such offices are necessary to prevent suffering it will be remembered that the missouri state convention in the month of july appointed and inaugurated a provisional state government this action was merely designed to supply a temporary executive authority until the people could elect new loyal state officers which election was ordered to be held on the first monday in november the convention also when it finished the work of its summer session adjourned to meet on the third monday in december eighteen sixty one but political and military affairs remained in so unsettled a condition during the whole autumn that anything like effective popular action was impracticable the convention was therefore called together in a third session at an earlier date october eleventh eighteen sixty one when it wisely adopted an ordinance postponing the state election for the period of one year and for continuing the officers of the provisional government until their successors should be duly appointed with his tenure of power thus prolonged governor gamble also by direction of the convention proposed to the president to raise a special force a missouri state militia for service within the state during the war there but to act with united states troops in military operations within the state or when necessary to its defense president lincoln accepted the plan upon the condition that whatever united states officer might be in command of the department of the west should also be commissioned by the governor to command the missouri state militia and that if the president changed the former the governor should make the corresponding change in order that conflict of authority or of military plans might be avoided this agreement was entered into between president lincoln and governor gamble on november sixth and on november twenty seventh brigadier general j m schofield received orders from halleck to raise organize and command this special militia corps the plan was attended with reasonable success and by the fifteenth of april eighteen sixty two reported general schofield an active efficient force of thirteen thousand eight hundred men was placed in the field nearly all of cavalry the raising and organizing of this force during the winter and spring of eighteen sixty one sixty two produced a certain degree of local military activity just at the season when the partisan and guerrilla operations of rebel sympathizers were necessarily impeded or wholly suspended by severe weather and this joined with the vigorous administration of general halleck and the fact that curtis was chasing the army of price out of southwest missouri gave a somewhat delusive appearance of quiet and order throughout the state we shall see how this security was rudely disturbed during the summer of eighteen sixty two by local efforts and uprisings though the rebels were not able to bring about any formidable campaign of invasion and missouri as a whole remained immovable in her military and political adherence to the union with a view still further to facilitate the restoration of public peace the state convention at the same october session extended an amnesty to repentant rebels 
in an ordinance which provided that any person who would make and file a written oath to support the federal and state government declaring that he would not take up arms against the united states or the provisional government of missouri nor give aid and comfort to their enemies during the present civil war should be exempt from arrest and punishment for previous rebellion many persons took this oath and doubtless kept it with sincere faith but it seems no less certain that many others who took it so persistently violated both its spirit and letter as to render it practically of no service as an external test of allegiance to the union in the years of local hatred and strife which ensued oaths were so recklessly taken and so wilfully violated that a ceremony of adjuration became in the public estimation rather a sign of suspicion than an assurance of good faith it grew into one of the standing jests of the camps that when a union soldier found a rattlesnake his comrades would instantly propose with mock gravity administer the oath to him boys and let him go End of chapter five chapter six of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay chapter six lincoln directs cooperation the president was highly gratified when halleck wrote from the department of missouri under date of december nineteenth to mcclellan who was yet general-in-chief that the discipline of the troops was improving that sundry minor expeditions had been successful that price would be ruined in missouri by another retreat and that he hoped soon to be able to attack him under favoring conditions also that he was gradually curing the serious disorders in military administration bequeathed him by fremont an excellent letter wrote lincoln as an endorsement though he also noted his regret that halleck was unfavorably impressed with lane on the kansas border from whose cooperation under hunter with a quasi-independent column the president had hoped for substantial benefit but the prospect at washington was not so encouraging except to organize drill and review the army of the potomac to make an unfruitful reconnaissance and to suffer the lamentable ball's bluff disaster mcclellan had nothing to show for his five months of local and two months of chief command the splendid autumn weather the wholesome air and dry roads had come and gone rain snow and mud crippling clogs to military movements in all lands and epochs were to be expected for a quarter if not for half the coming year besides all this mcclellan had fallen seriously ill with most urgent need of early action every prospect of securing it seemed to be thus cut off in this dilemma lincoln turned to the western commanders general mcclellan is sick he telegraphed to halleck on the last day of the year are general buell and yourself in concert the following day he repeated his inquiry or rather his prompting suggestion that mcclellan being incapable of work buell and halleck should at once establish a vigorous and hearty cooperation their replies were not specially promising there is no arrangement between general halleck and myself responded buell adding that he depended on mcclellan for instructions to this end while halleck said i have never received a word from general buell i am not ready to cooperate with him adding in his turn that he had written to mcclellan and that too much haste would ruin everything plainly therefore the military machine both east and west was not only at a complete standstill but was without a programme of what avail then were mcclellan's office and function of general-in-chief if such a contingency revealed either his incapacity or his neglect the force of this question is immensely increased when we see how in the same episode mcclellan's acts followed lincoln's suggestions 
however silent and confiding in the skill and energy of his generals the president had studied the military situation with unremitting diligence in his telegram of december thirty one to halleck he started a pregnant inquiry when he buell moves on bowling green what hinders it being reinforced from columbus and he asked the same question at the same time of buell halleck seems to have had no answer to make buell sent the only reply that was possible there is nothing to prevent bowling green being reinforced from columbus if a military force is not brought to bear on the latter place the sequel proves that lincoln was not content to permit this know nothing and do nothing policy to continue i have just been with general mcclellan and he is much better he wrote the day after new year's and in this interview the necessity for action and the telegrams from the western commanders were fully discussed as becomes evident from the fact that the following day mcclellan wrote a letter to halleck containing an earnest suggestion to remedy the neglect and need pointed out by lincoln's dispatch of december thirty one in this letter mcclellan advised an expedition up the cumberland river a demonstration on columbus and a feint on the tennessee river all for the purpose of preventing reinforcements from joining buckner and johnston at bowling green whom buell was preparing to attack meanwhile lincoln's dispatch of inquiry had renewed the attention and perhaps aroused the ambition of buell he and halleck had after lincoln's prompting interchanged dispatches about concerted action halleck reported a withdrawal of troops from missouri almost impossible to which buell replied that the great power of the rebellion in the west is arrayed on a line from columbus to bowling green and that two gunboat expeditions with a support of twenty thousand men should attack its centre by way of the cumberland and tennessee rivers and that whatever is done should be done speedily within a few days halleck however did not favorably entertain the proposition his reply discussed an altogether different question he said it would be madness for him with his forces to attempt any serious operation against camp beauregard or columbus and that if buell's bowling green movement required his help it ought to be delayed a few weeks when he could probably furnish some troops leaving altogether unanswered buell's suggestion for the movement up the cumberland and tennessee halleck stated his strong disapproval of the bowling green movement and on the same day he repeated these views a little more fully in a letter to the president premising that he could not then withdraw any troops from missouri without risking the loss of this state he said i know nothing of general buell's intended operations never having received any information in regard to the general plan of campaign if it be intended that his column shall move on bowling green while another moves from cairo or paducah on columbus or camp beauregard it will be a repetition of the same strategic error which produced the disaster of bull run to operate on exterior lines against an enemy occupying a central position will fail as it always has failed in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred it is condemned by every military authority i have ever read general buell's army and the forces at paducah occupy precisely the same position in relation to each other and to the enemy as did the armies of mcdowell and patterson before the battle of bull run lincoln finding in these replies but a continuation not only of the delay but also of the want of plans and especially of energetic joint action which had thus far in a majority of cases marked the operations of the various commanders was not disposed further to allow matters to remain in such unfruitful conditions under his prompting mcclellan on this same sixth of january wrote to buell halleck from his own account will not soon be in a condition to support properly a movement up the cumberland why not make the movement independently of and without waiting for that and on the next day lincoln followed this inquiry with a still more energetic monition please name as early a day as you safely can on or before which you can be ready to move southward 
in concert with major general halleck delay is ruining us and it is indispensable for me to have something definite i send a like dispatch to major general halleck this peremptory order seems to have brought nothing except a reply from halleck i have asked general buell to designate a day for a demonstration to assist him it is all i can do till i get arms three days later halleck's already quoted letter of the sixth reached washington by mail and after its perusal the president endorsed upon it with a heart sickness easily discernible in the words the within is a copy of a letter just received from general halleck it is exceedingly discouraging as everywhere else nothing can be done nevertheless something was being done very little at the moment it is true but enough to form the beginning of momentous results on the same day on which halleck had written the discouraging letter commented upon by the president he had also transmitted to grant at cairo the direction i wish you to make a demonstration in force on mayfield and in the direction of murray the object was as he further explained to prevent reinforcements being sent to buckner at bowling green he was to threaten camp beauregard and murray to create the impression that not only was dover fort donelson to be attacked but that a great army to be gathered in the west was to sweep down towards nashville his own column being merely an advance guard flag officer foot was to assist by a gunboat demonstration be very careful however added halleck to avoid a battle we are not ready for that but cut off detached parties and give your men a little experience in skirmishing if this order had gone to an unwilling or negligent officer he could have found in his surrounding conditions abundant excuse for evasion and non-compliance there was at cairo as at every other army post large or small lack of officers of organization of arms of equipments of transportation of that multitude of things considered necessary to the efficiency of moving troops but in the west the sudden increase of armies brought to command and to direction and management a large proportion of civilians lacking methodical instruction and experience which was without question a serious defect but which left them free to invent and adopt whatever expedients circumstances might suggest or which rendered them satisfied and willing to enter upon undertakings amid a want of preparation and means which better information might have led them to think indispensable the detailed reports and orders of the expedition we are describing clearly indicate these latter characteristics we learn from them that the weather was bad the roads heavy quartermaster's department and transportation deficient and gunboats without adequate crews yet nowhere does it appear that these things were treated as impediments halleck's instructions dated january sixth were received by grant on the morning of the eighth and his answer was that immediate preparations were being made for carrying them out and that flag officer andrew h foote would cooperate with three gunboats the continuous rains for the last week or more says grant have rendered the roads extremely bad and will necessarily make our movements slow this however will operate worse upon the enemy if he should come out to meet us than upon us the movement began on the evening of january nine and its main delay occurred through halleck's orders it was fully resumed on the twelfth brigadier-general john a mcclernand with five thousand men marched southward generally parallel to the mississippi river to mayfield midway between fort henry and columbus and pushed a reconnaissance close up to the latter place brigadier-general c f smith starting from paducah marched a strong column southward generally parallel to the tennessee river to callaway near fort henry foot and grant with three gunboats two of them new ironclads ascended the tennessee to fort henry drew the fire of the fort and threw several shells into the works 
we need not describe the routes the precautions the marching and counter-marching to mystify the enemy while the rebels were yet expecting a further advance the several detachments were already well on their return the expedition says grant if it had no other effect served as a fine reconnaissance but it had more positive results fort henry and columbus were thoroughly alarmed and drew in their outposts while the union forces learned from inspection that the route offered a feasible line of march to attack and invest columbus and demonstrated the inherent weakness and vulnerability of fort henry this be it remembered was done with raw forces and without preparation but with officers and men responding alike promptly to every order and executing their task more than cheerfully even eagerly with such means as were at hand when the order came the reconnaissance thus made reports mcclernand completed a march of one hundred and forty miles by the cavalry and seventy-five miles by the infantry over icy or miry roads during a most inclement season he further reports that the circumstances of the case prevented me from taking on leaving cairo the five days supply of rations and forage directed by the commanding officer of this district hence the necessity of an early resort to other sources of supply none other presented but to quarter upon the enemy or to purchase from loyal citizens i accordingly resorted to both expedients as i had opportunity lincoln's prompting did not end with merely having produced this reconnaissance the president's patience was well-nigh exhausted and while his uneasiness drove him to no act of rashness it caused him to repeat his admonitions and suggestions in addition to his telegraphs and letters to the western commanders between december thirty one and january six he wrote to both on january thirteen to point out how advantage might be taken of the military condition as it then existed halleck had emphasized the danger of moving on exterior lines and insisted that it was merely repeating the error committed at bull run and would as inevitably lead to disaster lincoln in his letter showed that the defeat at bull run did not result from movement on exterior lines but from failure to use exterior lines with judgment and concert and he further illustrated how the western armies might now by judicious cooperation secure important military results my dear sir your dispatch of yesterday is received in which you say i have received your letter and general mcclellan's and will at once devote all my efforts to your views and his in the midst of my many cares i have not seen nor asked to see general mcclellan's letter to you for my own views i have not offered and do not now offer them as orders and while i am glad to have them respectfully considered i would blame you to follow them contrary to your own clear judgment unless i should put them in the form of orders as to general mcclellan's views you understand your duty in regard to them better than i do with this preliminary i state my general idea of this war to be that we have the greater numbers and the enemy has the greater facility of concentrating forces upon points of collision that we must fail unless we can find some way of making our advantage an overmatch for his and that this can only be done by menacing him with superior forces at different points at the same time so that we can safely attack one or both if he makes no change and if he weakens one to strengthen the other forbear to attack the strengthened one but seize and hold the weakened one gaining so much to illustrate suppose last summer when winchester ran away to reinforce manassas we had forborne to attack manassas but had seized and held winchester i mention this to illustrate and not to criticize i did not lose confidence in mcdowell and i think less harshly of patterson than some others seem to in application of the general rule i am suggesting every particular case will have its modifying circumstances among which the most constantly present and most difficult to meet will be the want of perfect knowledge of the enemy's movements this had its part in the bull run case but worse in that case was the expiration of the terms of the three months men applying the principle to your case my idea is that halleck shall menace columbus and down river generally while you menace 
bowling green and east tennessee if the enemy shall concentrate at bowling green do not retire from his front yet do not fight him there either but seize columbus and east tennessee one or both left exposed by the concentration at bowling green it is a matter of no small anxiety to me and one which i am sure you will not overlook that the east tennessee line is so long and over so bad a road this letter was addressed to buell but a copy of it was also sent to halleck buell made no reply but halleck sent an indirect answer a week later in a long letter to general mcclellan under date of january twenty the communication is not a model of correspondence when we remember that it emanated from a trained writer upon military science it is long and somewhat rambling it finds fault with politics and politicians in war in evident ignorance of both politics and politicians it charges that past want of success is attributable to the politicians rather than to the generals in plain contradiction of the actual facts it condemns pepper box strategy and recommends detached operations in the same breath the more noticeable point of the letter is that while reiterating that the general-in-chief had furnished no general plan and while the principal commanders had neither unity of views nor concert of action it ventures though somewhat feebly to recommend a combined system of operations for the west the idea of moving down the mississippi by steam says halleck in this letter is in my opinion impracticable or at least premature it is not a proper line of operations at least now a much more feasible plan is to move up the cumberland and tennessee making nashville the first objective point this would turn columbus and force the abandonment of bowling green this line of the cumberland or tennessee is the great central line of the western theatre of war with the ohio below the mouth of green river as the base and two good navigable rivers extending far into the interior of the theatre of operations but the plan should not be attempted without a large force not less than sixty thousand effective men the idea was by no means new buell had tentatively suggested it to mcclellan as early as november twenty seven and had again specifically elaborated it as the most important strategical point in the whole field of operations to mcclellan on december twenty nine and as the centre of the rebellion front in the west to halleck on january three yet recognizing this line as the enemy's chief weakness mcclellan at washington buell at louisville and halleck at st louis holding the president's unlimited trust and authority had allowed nearly two months to elapse directing the government power to other objects to the neglect not alone of military success but of plans of cooperation of counsel of intention to use this great and recognized military advantage until the country was fast losing confidence and even hope even now halleck did not propose immediately to put his theory into practice like buell he was calling for more troops for the politicians to supply it is impossible to guess when he might have been ready to move on his great strategic line if subordinate officers more watchful and enterprising had not in a measure forced the necessity upon his attention End of chapter six chapter seven of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay chapter seven grant and thomas in kentucky the opening of the year eighteen sixty two brought stirring events to the armies of the west and in their action the name of general grant begins to acquire a special prominence and value in the early stage of military organization in the west when so many volunteer colonels were called to active duty in the field the west point education of grant and his practical campaign training in the mexican war made themselves immediately felt and appreciated at the department headquarters 
his usefulness and superiority were evinced by the clearness and brevity of his correspondence the correctness of routine reports and promptness of their transmission the pertinence and practical quality of his suggestions the readiness and fertility of expedient with which he executed orders any one reading over his letters of this first period of his military service is struck by the fact that through him something was always accomplished there was absence of excuse complaint or delay always the report of a task performed if his means or supplies were imperfect he found or improvised the best available substitute if he could not execute the full requirement he performed so much of it as was possible he always had an opinion and that opinion was positive intelligible practical we find therefore that his allotted tasks from the first continually rose in importance he gained in authority and usefulness not by solicitation or intrigue but by services rendered he was sent to more and more difficult duties to larger supervision to heavier responsibilities from guarding a station at mexico on the north missouri railroad to protecting a railroad terminus near ironton in southeast missouri from there to brief inspection duty at jefferson city then to the command of the military district of southeast missouri finally to the command of the great military depot and rendezvous at cairo illinois with its several outlying posts and districts and the supervision of its complicated details about troops arms and supplies to be collected and forwarded in all directions clearly it was not chance which brought him to such duties but his fitness to perform them it was from the vantage ground of this enlarged command that he had checkmated the rebel occupation of columbus by seizing paducah and smithland and from cairo he also organized and led his first command in field fighting at what is known as the battle of belmont just before fremont was relieved and while he was in the field in nominal pursuit of price he had ordered grant to clear southeastern missouri of guerrillas with the double view of restoring local authority and preventing reinforcements to price movements were progressing to this end when it became apparent that the rebel stronghold at columbus was preparing to send out a column grant organized an expedition to counteract this design and on the evening of november sixth left cairo with about three thousand men on transports under convoy of two gunboats and steamed down the river upon information gained while on his route he determined to break up a rebel camp at belmont landing on the missouri shore opposite columbus as the best means of making his expedition effective on the morning of the seventh he landed his troops at hunter's point three miles above belmont and marched to a favorable place for attack back of the rebel encampment which was situated in a large open field and was protected on the land side by a line of abatis by the time grant reached his position the rebel camp originally consisting of a single regiment had been reinforced by five regiments from columbus under general pillow a deliberate battle with about equal forces ensued though the confederate line courageously contested the ground the union line steadily advancing swept the rebels back penetrating the abatis and gaining the camp of the enemy who in disorder took shelter under the steep river bank grant's troops had gained a complete and substantial victory but they now frittered it away by a disorderly exultation the record does not show who was responsible for the unmilitary conduct but it quickly brought its retribution before the unionists were aware of it general polk had sent an additional reinforcement of several regiments across the river and hurriedly marched them to cut off the federal retreat which instead of an orderly march from the battlefield became a hasty scramble to get out of danger grant himself unaware that the few companies left as a guard near the landing had already embarked 
remained on shore to find them and encountered instead the advancing rebel line discovering his mistake he rode back to the landing where his horse slid down the river bank on its haunches and trotted on board a transport over a plank thrust out for him belmont was a drawn battle or rather it was first a victory for the federals and then a victory for the confederates the courage and the loss were nearly equal seventy nine killed and two hundred and eighty nine wounded on the union side one hundred and five killed and four hundred and nineteen wounded on the confederate side brigadier-general mcclernand second in command in the battle of belmont was a fellow townsman of the president and to him lincoln wrote the following letter of thanks and encouragement to the troops engaged this is not an official but a social letter you have had a battle and without being able to judge as to the precise measure of its value i think it is safe to say that you and all with you have done honor to yourselves and the flag and service to the country most gratefully do i thank you and them in my present position i must care for the whole nation but i hope it will be no injustice to any other state for me to indulge a little home pride that illinois does not disappoint us i have just closed a long interview with mr washburne in which he has detailed the many difficulties you and those with you labor under be assured we do not forget or neglect you much very much goes undone but it is because we have not the power to do it faster than we do some of your forces are without arms but the same is true here and at every other place where we have considerable bodies of troops the plain matter of fact is our good people have rushed to the rescue of the government faster than the government can find arms to put into their hands it would be agreeable to each division of the army to know its own precise destination but the government cannot immediately nor inflexibly at any time determine as to all nor if determined can it tell its friends without at the same time telling its enemies we know you do all as wisely and well as you can and you will not be deceived if you conclude the same is true of us please give my respects and thanks to all belmont having been a mere episode it drew after it no further movement in that direction grant and his command resumed their routine work of neighborhood police and observation buell and halleck both coming to their departments as new commanders shortly afterwards were absorbed with difficulties at other points secession was not yet quieted in kentucky the union troops at cairo paducah smithland and other river towns yet stood on the defensive fearing rebel attack rather than preparing to attack rebels columbus and bowling green were the principal confederate camps and attracted and received the main attention of the union commanders the first noteworthy occurrence following belmont as well as the beginning of the succession of brilliant union victories which distinguished the early months of the year eighteen sixty two was the battle of mill springs in eastern kentucky the earnest desire of president lincoln and general mcclellan that a union column should be sent to seize and hold east tennessee and the reluctance and neglect of general buell to carry out their wishes have been described general thomas remained posted in eastern kentucky hoping that he might be called upon to form his column and lead it through the cumberland gap to knoxville but the weeks passed by and the orders which he received only tended to scatter his few regiments for local defence and observation with the hesitation of the union army at this point the confederates became bolder brigadier-general f k zollicoffer established himself in a fortified camp on the north bank of the cumberland river where he could at the same time defend cumberland gap and incite eastern kentucky to rebellion here he became so troublesome that buell found it necessary to dislodge him and late in december sent general thomas orders to that effect thomas was weak in numbers but strong in vigilance and courage he made a difficult march during the early weeks of january eighteen sixty two and halted at logan's cross roads within ten miles of the rebel camp to await the junction of his few regiments the enemy under zollicoffer and his district commander george b crittenden 
resolved to advance and crush him before he could bring his force together thomas prepared and accepted battle the enemy had made a fatiguing night march of nine miles through a cold rain and over muddy roads on the morning of january nineteen the battle was begun with spirit and soon had a dramatic incident the rebel commander zollicoffer mistaking a union regiment rode forward and told its commanding officer colonel speed s fry that he was firing upon friends fry not aware that zollicoffer was an enemy turned away to order his men to stop firing at this moment one of zollicoffer's aides rode up and seeing the true state of affairs drew his revolver and began firing at fry wounding his horse fry wheeling in turn drew his revolver and returned the fire shooting zollicoffer through the heart the fall of the rebel commander served to hasten and complete the defeat of the confederates they retreated in disorder to their fortified camp at mill springs thomas ordered immediate pursuit and the same night invested their camp and made preparations to storm their entrenchments the following morning when day came however it was found that the rebels had crossed the cumberland river during the night abandoning their wounded twelve pieces of artillery many small arms and extensive supplies and had fled in utter dispersion to the mountains it was one of the most remarkable union victories of the war general thomas's forces consisted of a little over six regiments those of crittenden and zollicoffer of over ten regiments it was more than a defeat for the confederates their army was annihilated and cumberland gap once more stood exposed so that buell might have sent a union column and taken possession of eastern tennessee with but feeble opposition it is possible that the brilliant opportunity would at last have tempted him to comply with the urgent wishes of the president and the express orders of the general-in-chief had not unexpected events in another quarter diverted his attention and interest there was everywhere about the months of december eighteen sixty one and january eighteen sixty two a perceptible increase of the union armies by fresh regiments from the northern states a better supply of arms through recent importations an increase of funds from new loans and the delivery for use of various war materials the product of the summer's manufacture of prime importance to the military operations which centred at cairo was the completion and equipment of the new gunboats a word of retrospect concerning this arm of the military service is here necessary commander john rogers was sent west in the month of may eighteen sixty one to begin the construction of war vessels for western rivers without definite plans he had purchased and hastily converted and armed as best he could three river steamers these were put into service in september they were provided with cannon but had no iron plating they were the tyler of seven guns the lexington of six guns and the conestoga of three guns making cairo their central station they served admirably in the lighter duties of river police in guarding transports and in making hasty trips of reconnaissance for the great expedition down the mississippi projected during the summer and fall of eighteen sixty one a more powerful class of vessels was provided the distinguished civil engineer james b eads designed and was authorized to build seven new gunboats to carry thirteen guns each and to be protected about the bows with iron plating capable of resisting the fire of heavy artillery they were named the cairo carondelet cincinnati louisville mound city pittsburgh and st louis two additional gunboats of the same type of construction but of larger size the benton of sixteen guns and the essex of five guns were converted from other vessels about the same time at the time commodore foote finally accepted the first seven january fifteenth eighteen sixty two it was found impossible to supply them with crews of eastern seamen resort was had to western steamboat men and also to volunteers from infantry recruits 
the joint reconnaissance of grant and foot to fort henry on the tennessee river january fourteen has been related a second examination was made by general c f smith who on january twenty two reported that he had been within two miles and a half of the fort that the river had risen fourteen feet since the last visit giving a better opportunity to reconnoitre more important that the high water had drowned out a troublesome advance battery and that in his opinion two ironclad gunboats could make short work of it it is evident that possessed of this additional information grant and foot immediately resolved upon vigorous measures grant had already asked permission to visit halleck at st louis this was given but halleck refused to entertain his project of an attack so firmly convinced was grant however that his plan was good that though unsuccessful at first he quickly renewed the request commanding general grant and myself telegraphed foot to halleck january twenty eighth eighteen sixty two are of opinion that fort henry on the tennessee river can be carried with four ironclad gunboats and troops to permanently occupy have we your authority to move for that purpose when ready to this grant on the same day added the direct proposal with permission i will take fort henry on the tennessee and establish and hold a large camp there it would appear that no immediate answer was returned for on the following day grant renewed his proposition with more emphasis it is easy to perceive what produced a change in halleck's mind grant's persistent urging was evidently the main influence but two other events contributed essentially to the result the first was the important victory gained by thomas at mill springs in eastern kentucky on january nineteenth the certain news of which was probably just reaching him the second was a telegram from washington informing him that general beauregard with fifteen regiments from the confederate army in virginia was being sent to kentucky to be added to johnston's army i was not ready to move explains halleck afterwards but deemed best to anticipate the arrival of beauregard's forces it is well also to remember in this connection that three days before president lincoln's general war order number one had been published ordering a general movement of all the armies of the union on the coming twenty second of february whatever induced it the permission now given was full and hearty make your preparations to take and hold fort henry halleck telegraphed to grant on the thirtieth of january i will send you written instructions by mail grant and foot had probably already begun their preparation receiving halleck's instructions on february one grant on the following day started his expedition of fifteen thousand men on transports and foot on the fourth accompanied him with seven gunboats for convoy and attack their plan contemplated a bombardment by the fleet from the river and assault on the land side by the troops for this purpose general mcclernand with a division was landed four miles below the fort on february four they made a reconnaissance on the fifth and being joined by another division under general smith were ordered forward to invest the fort on the sixth this required a circuitous march of eight miles during which the gunboats of flag officer foot having less than half the distance to go by the river moved on and began the bombardment the capture proved easier than was anticipated general lloyd tilghman the confederate commander of the fort had early that morning sent away his three thousand infantry to fort donelson being convinced that he was beset by an overpowering force he kept only one company of artillerists to work the eleven river guns of the fort with these he defended the work about two hours but without avail foot's four iron-plated gunboats steamed up boldly within six hundred yards the bombardment though short was well sustained on both sides and not without its fluctuating chances two of the heaviest guns in the fort were soon silenced one bursting and the other being rendered useless by an accident with the priming wire at this point a rebel shot passed through the casemate and boiler of the gunboat essex and she drifted helplessly out of the fight 
but the remaining gunboats continued their close and fierce attack and five more of the rebel guns being speedily disabled general tilghman hauled down his flag and went on board to surrender the fort mcclernand's troops from the land side soon after entered the work and took formal possession on the same day grant telegraphed to hallett fort henry is ours and his dispatch bore yet another significant announcement eminently characteristic of the man i shall take and destroy fort donelson on the eighth End of chapter seven